want to play a game of word association with you. Ready? Picture genius. How many of you pictured this guy? Okay. Or maybe some of these folks. Or really any similar person. But how many of you pictured these guys? How come? How come people don't see the genius in our classrooms? Perhaps it's because some of the assumptions we have around genius. We assume geniuses have some uncommon natural ability, that they are individual protagonists, and that they work in a linear fashion towards singular goals. What I call the IQ myth, the lone wolf myth, and the prodigal myth. Since the days of the ancient Greeks, people have looked for the natural traits of genius. Today, one of the most commonly used forms of measuring genius is the intelligence quotient, or IQ test. Yet, is high IQ a necessary indicator of genius? Nineteen twenty psychologist Louis Tremon ran a study looking at just that. In the study, Tremon tested more than 1,000 children who passed his IQ test and thus met his genius threshold. While the study is still ongoing today, none of Tremon's geniuses went on to win important scientific prizes or become significant artists. However, two children who had actually failed the test went on to win Nobel Prizes in physics. Intelligence isn't necessarily an indicator of genius. Nikola Tesla. This is often the narrative of genius, a recluse toiling alone. But is that myth true? Apparently not. By just this past month, Rainer Weiss, professor at MIT, was recently awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on gravitational waves. And while Weiss headlined the bill, the prize was in fact won by three people. More so, Weiss was quick to explain it wasn't won by three, people, but the work of more than 1,000 researchers involved in the project. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in 1928, but the drug wouldn't be fully implemented until the Second World War. It took two chemists and the full weight of the U.S. War Department to realize the potential of Fleming's discovery. It wasn't the work of a lone genius, it literally took an army. Genius, most often, is a collective achievement. Most people assume that geniuses are resolute and move in an unwavering path. Economist David Galenson says this perception is only partly true. He divides geniuses into two camps. The first he calls conceptual innovators, those with a focused message, a clear direction, and incendiary talent. Pablo Picasso is a perfect example. Much of Picasso's most famous works were actually created under the age of 25. These people we call prodigies. But hold on, says Galenson, that's but one kind of genius. The other he calls experimental innovators. These people work through an iterative process. They work and rework an idea until it flowers as genius. Paul Cezanne. Paul Cezanne's most celebrated work, that is, which most, that is most valuable, and is shown most often, actually come from the final year of his life. It took a lifetime to achieve genius. Other experimental innovators include Irving Berlin, Mark Twain, and Alfred Hitchcock. It's so often the experimentation, the process itself, that spurs genius. If we believe that our theories about geniuses are myths, it has clear implications for how we think about learning, and education in general. Put aside the IQ myth, and we realize that each of our learners has the capability of doing something special, of truly making a difference. Put aside the lone wolf myth, and we realize that we need to put even greater emphasis on collaboration within our schools. Put aside the prodigal myth, and we realize we need to provide time for experimentation in our schools. Time to respect the iterative nature of learning. These three components, inclusion, collaboration, 
and experimentation are the future of our schools and the bright lights ahead. Thank you.